All right, guys, what's going on? Welcome back to the Everything College Football Podcast. Today we're doing a preview and a prediction for Oregon versus Oregon State. Big-time ranked matchup in the Pac-12. A more underrated contest going down this weekend as Oregon is looking to punch their ticket to Vegas for the Pac-12 title game. Over-under set at 56, 3.5-point line in favor of the Ducks. 3.30 p.m. Eastern time on ABC. Research Stadium in Corvallis will be the site of this one, and Oregon leads the series 67-48 all-time. And there's also been 10 ties in this series history. It's a pretty overwhelming amount. Looking at the Ducks' offense, over 40 points per game, 511 yards per contest. Offense has been lights out, but, you know, a new development has went down for the Ducks, and that's just Bo Nix's injury. You know, he's got a foot or a leg injury of sorts. Don't know the exact details on that. But um, it's really limited to this offense because he's now very hobbled. You know, against Utah, they were not able to run the ball one bit with his, you know, you know, the lack of vertical awareness really from this rushing attack was not present with him not being able to run the ball. He only had two carries for negative three yards, and he averages about eight to 12 carries per contest. You know, he's had 509 yards and 14 touchdowns on the year. You know, his ability to run and make plays, uh, you know, not just to pick up yards, but to improvise when needed is a big part of this offense. And that was not evident against Utah. He was incredibly hobbled. It was very interesting to see. I mean, he was still able to throw for 287 and a touchdown. Did have a pick, almost threw another one as well. Uh, you know, just being injured, you know, he was not able to put the same velocity on the ball, of course, you know, again, not able to run. And that's, uh, you know, that's been a big deal for this offense because his skills have been a, the ma- a major reason, the ho- whole reason why they have been able to perform this well this season. 857 yards and three touchdowns for Bucky Irving. Noah Whittington, 671, four touchdowns. Those guys are also two transfers. 25 carries, 59 yards for Utah running the ball compared to having 313 the week prior against Washington. Utah, their defense hasn't exactly been great this year against the run. So that was, you know, that, that right there shows you, though. Of course, they had less, they had, you know, half the attempts they had against Washington, but, you know, six yards per t- carry in that game compared to 2.3 against the Utes. You know, just Knicks, is, Knicks being hobbled. You know, it's a big reason why they were not able to run the ball. That's going to be a problem coming into this game, I'd say, because, you know, Knicks, looking at how hobbled he was, there's no way he's going to be anywhere near 100% in, you know, a week time. Uh, receiving group wise, Troy Franklin, 48 grabs, 79, seven touchdowns, leads the team in all those categories. Chris Hudson, 41 for 451, has yet to find the end zone this year. Dante Thornton had a great grab in that game against Utah, 15 receptions for 343 yards, averaging almost 23 per catch. Bucky Irving's been a heck of a pass catcher for them, 25 for 274. I like Terrence Ferguson at tight end. Chase Cota, UCLA transfers, battled some health like he has every single year of his career. Uh, this is a good offense mainly because of how phenomenal the offensive line is. You know, Jackson Powers Johnson, he's played well in relief for Alex Forsyth, who did not play, I don't believe, against Utah. I don't know why. Uh, but he's been a heck of a pass blocker for them. They're really going to need him, especially if they're going to try to make a run here at the Pac-12 title game and even win that game if they make it there. T.J. Bass, a tackle. Him and Forsyth, two veterans here that were left over from Mario Cristobal's day. Good offensive line, though. They've only allowed... You know, I think it's two sacks on the year. They lead the nation in fewest sacks allowed. They run the ball incredibly well because, you know, 230, 20, 223 yards per contest comes from this uh, offensive line just getting a great push. Of course, they didn't look good against Utah, though. Uh, you know, it's a mixture between a good offensive line and a quarterback who does a lot. Uh, you know, it's going to be interesting to see what happens. I just don't feel like they're going to be able to attack vertically like they usually do. Running between the tackles, it's going to be much easier for Oregon State to defend this running game. But top to bottom, when this offense is clicking, they're hot and they're hard to stop. And that's been the theme ever since they lost to Georgia back in week one. They've just been flaming opponents other than Utah, where Knicks, of course, was hobbled. Looking at the Oregon State offense, this is an interesting unit for Jonathan Smith. 32 points per contest. Quarterback position has not been a strong one this year. Chance Nolan, I thought he would take that next step, kind of like Jake Luton did a couple years ago in his second year uh, with Jonathan Smith. Nolan, though, complete opposite. You know, complete only 59%, seven touchdowns, eight picks, and five games before he got hurt. It's been Ben Gulbarasan since, you know, 63% completion rate for him, 153 yards per contest, three picks. So they've certainly cut down on the turnovers, eight touchdowns. I mean, he's really just been a game manager at this point behind a really good offensive line uh, and strong running game. Deshaun Fenwick, he's a bigger back, uh, you know, 226 pounds. He's been a little beat up the last couple of weeks. You know, he's not played, you know, in three of the last four games. Uh, he did play against Washington where he had two touchdowns on only five attempts. Damian Martinez, though, he's a freshman that a lot of people raved about in the program coming into this season. He's up to 867 yards and seven touchdowns behind, uh, you know, the last month or so of just great work. He's really stepped up in the absence of Fenwick. I mean, you're looking at five straight games of 100-plus yards. Stanford, he had 83 yards on only three touches, and he had a touchdown in that one. That was a one-point win, so that was a big-time play. Uh, you know, since the 8th of uh, October, he's just been running all over opponents. You know, I, I'm, not, I'm not shocked one bit. He really seems to be a good scheme fit, 216 pounds. 
good offensive line, much like last year for Oregon State. This is a unit that was highly underrated. Jake Levin, good at center. He's going to be an all-conference performer. He's been great for them. Uh, you know, Talizi, Fuanga, he's been good for them also at his tackle spot. This is an offensive line that's really good, really underrated. They're phenomenal at run blocking. Uh, Fenwick, day-to-day, hopefully they get him back because they're going to want to run the ball here. I mean, that's really the identity of their offense. Trayshawn Harrison, 50 grabs for 589 yards, four touchdowns. Uh, you know, this offense is nothing too special. You know, they run the ball very well. They get enough out of their quarterback, you know, 192 yards per game on the ground. Uh, they got, you know, a nice group of pass catchers. Anthony Gold has some good speed. Tyjon Lindsey, he's a producer for them. Uh, but overall, this is not a deep group of receivers. It's not a great passing attack, but they do certainly do just enough, uh, you know, in converting on only 30, 43% of their third downs. Not the worst margin in the world, but Oregon State offense, you know, they somehow seem to be a really respectable unit, and I think when Fenwick's back for this game, that's really going to help them out, uh, you know, immensely. And the Oregon defense, for the most part, it's not been, you know, a great year for this defense. I mean, they have some good individual players, and they've had some great bright spots. You know, Brandon Doyle's up front with nine TFL. He's probably their best defensive lineman. DJ Johnson coming off the edge, eight and a half TFL. Uh, Keon Ware Hudson. I like this defensive line. I think they got some good size. I got some nice depth as well. Pass rush only has 15 sacks on the year. Six of those coming from Johnson. Two and a half from Doyle's. After that, you know, one each or less for everyone else. It's not a good pass rush one bit. You know, I don't think that's really going to hurt them in this game. I mean, they've had zero sacks in four out of the last five games. Uh, that's certainly been a problem for the Ducks, and it might be a problem in this one, but I don't think it will be because that's it's not a team that's going to look to win downfield. They're not going to want to drop back 30 or 40 times, so maybe the you know lack of pass rush will not hurt them in this one. I love their linebacking core, though. Noah Sewell, Justin Flo. They haven't exactly had the bestest of years, you know, especially Sewell, who you thought was really going to take that next step and be among the nation's elite this season. But uh, it's a very serviceable duo there, the signal callers for the Ducks. And, uh, you know, they really struggled against Washington in the back end. You know, Bennett Williams wasn't great outside at corner. They weren't exactly phenomenal. They gave up 400-plus yards in that one, a lot of busts in the back end. Uh, you know, it was a nice bounce back week here against Utah. They gave up, I think, 10 receptions to Dalton Kincaid, a tight end. But, you know, Utah, you kind of expected them to not be great passing the ball. I think they four, it was three picks they forced. Um, but they weren't going to, ex- you weren't expecting them to attack you downfield. Christian Gonzalez is a heck of a corner. Love his size, mixed in with his speed. Jamal Hill's been around a good bit. Um, overall, this is a defense that, you know, it's kind of iffy. 26 and a half points per game. They do give up under 400 yards per contest. They've been pretty strong against the run. Only gave up 156 rushing against Utah. They were able to really collapse the interior, and that's going to be important in this one because uh, I think overall this has been a pretty sound run defense. They were not great against UCLA one bit, but other than that, it's really only blemish on the year. They did give up those four touchdowns to Georgia back in week one, but, you know, I think this is a pretty good matchup for this defensive front against Oregon State in their running game. I mean, it's a pretty similar matchup to that of Utah from a week ago, uh, you know, which is good news for them because this defense has just been, you know, kind of all over the place. I do think that the front seven is their strong suit, and I think Gonzalez at corner, he's great for them. One of the Oregon State defenses is a very underrated unit, 330 yards point per game, 20 points per contest allowed, you know, early on in the year. They only gave up 17 points to the USC on the 24th of September. I mean, the next week they got blasted by Utah. Uh, I, think that was, I think they turned the ball over a lot in that one, though. They held up very well against Washington. Gave up only 357 to USC. They had the ball for 73 plays, and they held them in check. That's the only defense this year that's been able to do that. Utah the next week, they did have 42 points off a lot of mistakes. They only had 361 yards. Uh, they've only allowed 400-plus yards once this year. That was week two against Fresno State. Since then, they've not did that. Held Washington 398. They were very good against that passing attack. Did not give up many big plays. And Penix had like a six-yard per attempt average. Of that nature, gave up less than 300. Arizona State, 156 to Cal. I mean, this is just a defense that's been very good. Only 368 on 74 plays against Washington State. These are really good offenses that they're holding in check. Oregon State's defense has not given, you know, gotten a lot of credit this year. 5.2 yards per play allowed, you know, top to bottom. They've just been so good this season. Again, only once have they given up more than four. And I mean, this is a defense that is very, very underrated. And it starts with a phenomenal duo of corners, Rajon Wright and Alex Austin. These guys have been phenomenal for them in the back year. It was a strong suit coming into the season, and they've certainly lived up to expectations. Ryan Cooper has been great also of eight pass breakups. Austin, he has eight of his own. Uh, you know, you look at Jaden Grant at safety. He's got three interceptions. He's been a ball hawk for them. This is a really good secondary I really like. Uh, and then you look at their run defense as well, though. You know, it's kind of been the perfect storm for Oregon State. Jonathan Smith, a former offensive coordinator at Washington, you figured they would be, you know, great on offense. But it's really been the defense that's been great. You know, they only give up nine yards rushing the cow, uh, 154 to Arizona State. That's a versatile rushing attack. They gave up 
only 100 to Washington. You know, they held, you know, they've been held never one in check. They have not allowed over 180 yards rushing once this year. Washington State only 23 yards rushing. I mean, this is a really good defense. People do not give them enough credit. They're not talked about one bit. You know, James Rawls has been very strong on the interior D-line against the run. You know, this is not a very productive unit. There's not a lot of household names other than those three defensive backs that I named. I think those guys are all household names. And I think at linebacker, you know, a guy that's been around a long time, and Amar Spates leads the team with 64 tackles. Keaton Aladipo has been good against the run also. Uh, you know, there's not many household names. You know, they're not great production. Rawls, you know, he's the leader of tackles for loss of eight and a half. Uh, Riley Sharp, three sacks. They have 15 sacks of their own. Both teams have 15 sacks exactly. So you're not going to expect much pass rush in this one. And, you know, with Nick's hobbled, I think this is going to be an opportunity for Oregon State to send some blitzes, you know, mix and match a little bit, come after Nick's and, you know, hope that he can get it out. That's certainly over the years been a strong suit for him when Nick's has, is forced to make a quick decision. George game, for example, when he's forced and pressured hard, it's where he tends to make mistakes. So I think Oregon State, this defense, I think this is going to be a pretty good matchup for them, and I like their chances here at home. Look at the team comparisons. For the most part, I'm going to give the Oregon Ducks, you know, a major edge in most categories. Bo Nix, very good quarterback this year for Oregon. He's going to get the clear edge there. Running back, I think both teams are pretty strong at the running back position. I'm going to give the edge to the Beavers, though. I like Damian Martinez. His emergence has been great. Deshaun Fenwick, a big fan of his when he gets the ball. Wide receiver, the Ducks. Uh, you know, Hudson, you know, uh, he's big time for them. Thornton as well. You know, this is a very deep receiving core for Oregon, I would say. Uh, the Beavers, they have a handful of nice options. You know, Troy Franklin for the Ducks, though. I think he's individually better than anyone on the Beavers roster. Trayshawn Harrison's really good. But, um, you know, that's pretty easy there. Offensive line-wise, the Beavers, strong O-line. But the Ducks, they're, again, first nationally. A few with sacks allowed. you got to get the edge there. Defensive line-wise, I love Brandon Dorless, Keon Ware-Hudson. I think that the uh, depth on the defensive line is a little bit underrated for the Ducks. Casey Rogers has been solid for them as well. So I'm going to give the edge to the Ducks there. And then at linebacker, I like Flo and Sewell. Lamar Spates, I'm a big fan of his. And again, Alo Depot has been a big-time performer for them. Get the edge there. And then we're going to give a clear edge at the secondary to the Beavers. You know, they gave up 400-plus yards to Washington, that being the Ducks, while Oregon State held them in check. But they held up very well against Washington, gave up only a 58% completion rate. They did not give up many big plays, 5.7 yards per attempt. I mean, they were just really good in that game against Washington. So I'm going to give them the edge in the secondary. Final thoughts on the prediction here, you know, for Oregon, the biggest key, slow down that ground and pound of Oregon State's. And then I think get off on the field on third and short. This is a team that ranks 128th in college football and third down opponent conversion rate. That's terrible. It's dead bottom there. Uh, Oregon State, you know, Bo Nix not 100%. Collapse the edge versus the run game. Force them inside against some really good linebackers. It's really going to make things tough for their running game because that's what they want to do as well. You no, know, they've not they've not been one-dimensional at all this year other than the game against Utah. Uh, and then you continue to stand, stall in the, stand tall in the secondary. You know, you're facing a really talented receiving core. But I like – their ability to match up in the back end. And I think Oregon State's going to win this game. I think they'll pull the upset here in Corvallis against the Ducks, 34-27. You know, again, they're losing a lot when they're a vertical run threat with Knicks not being 100%. Uh, and I think that they're going to, you know, play very well against the pass as well. You know, I know they're able to make some big plays downfield against Utah. I don't think they're going to be able to do that here in this one. So I'm going to take the Beavers to win in an upset. That's going to be it for today's episode, guys. Make sure you like, comment, subscribe. See you next time.